biogas invention should be preserved under memory of the bird program what i am trying to communicate here that there is a lack of understanding among the people that what these programs are meant for and what are the mandate and purpose of these programs and such workshops are very very important for uh, having understanding first amongst the policy makers those uh, work in various department of culture the people work in museums libraries and archives and also those who are associated with different culture industry so my uh, efforts will be to make you understand what this exactly unesco memory of the world program is there but besides that simply speaking like you have been hearing about unesco convention 2003 2005 i will give you a very simple definition of three flagship program in my presentation that what exactly you need to know uh, you are, you are not supposed to know all technicalities of those conventions you simply know, need to know two things what these programs are what their mandate and how to prepare a nomination dossier so forget about history and uh, its uh, technicalities and when the convention was um, uh, issued because right now you, as a, as a stakeholder you are concerned about how to submit a nomination dossier for your cultural heritage your documentary heritage or your uh, uh, traditions rituals so in this context like uh, as uh, uh, i have been introduced that i represent india in unesco uh, memory of the world program as a member of iac uh, apart from that i am also uh, working or closely associated with new program which is many of us still don't know that is the uh unesco is celeb celebrating this decade as a decade of indigenous uh, international indigenous languages from 2022 to 2032 but that is not part of this uh, workshop so i will not mo talk more about that let's begin with this unesco memory of the world program it was basically if you know that uh, world is under different uh uh disasters man made disaster like uh, conflict of uh bars and also various kind of terrorist activities so it was realized in 1992 that uh how to safeguard our documentary heritage because whenever there is a attack when there is a flood when there is a uh, earthquake libraries are being destroyed or uh, 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 documentary heritage is being damaged and our entire knowledge system lies in those ancient manuscripts our history lies on those books and rare books so how to that preserve for posterity so in this context this a uh, program which is very specifically designed for documentary heritage and i will give you what basically documentary heritage we are talking about in my new slides and its mission is that we know in the ancient past there were no boundaries there were no countries entire world was only one so keeping that in mind unesco believes that this documentary heritage belongs to all it belongs to the humanity and when it belongs to humanity it is the responsibility of the entire world community to safeguard it and keeping in that mind this particular program was enacted but uh, other than that there are different important programs so th i consider these are the three flagship program you must know about it and uh, you have been hearing about these programs from the last last uh, 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 first session or inaugural session onwards so simply these flagship uh, three flagship program which one is basically world heritage convention which is a uh, nomination of the heritage sites monuments cities and various kind of natural or cultural landscapes so that's the world heritage and you simply need to understand if you need any information apart from the unesco website archaeological survey of india is the agency in india so if you need any information you need anything to do with this you should contact asi for this they will provide you more details and more information other than unesco new delhi office and unesco site definitely when we talk about ich entire team of snas there and they will give you more information and how 
things are being done uh, under this ICH. And all kind of oral traditions, uh, all kind of performing arts, social practices, rituals, festive events, knowledge system. Like you all know last, uh, this very recent we have uh, nominated Durga uh, Puja. Uh, so that's, that's the way like ICH works. So in this like a uh, major role comes from uh, Department of Art and Culture of different states along with the Ministry of Culture rather than uh, individuals because in such nominations these departments play a major role and uh, the, the, those stakeholders, the people working in these departments have to understand. Similarly, when we talk about the memory of the world program, all libraries, archives are the repository of uh, entire documentary heritage. So all state libraries, state archives or any kind of uh, manuscript library which possess uh, most valuable and most uh, unique heritage, they need to understand that all kind of documentary heritage in electronic, audio, video, print, uh, handwritten format have to be nominated under this UNESCO Memory of the World program. And why it is important to preserve this documentary heritage? Because it, these are considered memory repositories. They preserve our memories. Documentary heritage is the uh, largest source of, of documenting our memories. That's why libraries and archives are also known as memory institutions. And that's the reason why this program was named Memory of the World Program. And in this context, like, uh, we need to understand that if we have we have understanding of our epics. Uh, if we know about our Vedas, we know about Purans, we know about uh, our Indian culture and tradition. It is because of the manuscripts. Because that information was transferred from one generation to another generation. And that is our responsibility that what we have been given, what we have been blessed by our ancestor, it is our responsibility to forward the same to the new generation. Maybe media may change uh, because we cannot preserve those manuscripts forever. But we have to migrate from this print audio to electronic media and then we have to preserve. So electronic documents are very much part of this documentary heritage. It is very clearly defined. This slide will give you information, manuscripts, epigraphs and books, all kind of archival document, audiovisual records, photographs, digital records. Everything comes under this particular uh, documentary heritage. Like last nomination, we received a nomination for Wikipedia. Now, there was a lot of debate. Ultimately, we rejected that nomination in IAC because we considered Wikipedia is not a permanent documentary heritage. It keeps on changing. It is, it is, it is every day being updated. So, when, when you nominate something, we also need to understand that you cannot nominate a book written by a recent author. You have to understand the certain kind of rarity and other thing which I will give you in the end. And this program operates at three levels. There is an international level, international register, then there is a regional register, and there is a national register. When we talk about international register, means Paris headquarters operates it. When we talk about regional register, according to UNESCO, the world has been divided into five regions. Uh, from Asia, Pacific, Arab, Europe, North America, Latin America, and uh, Caribbean. So all these five regional regions have five regional committees. So every regional committee has one regional register. Like for us, we have international register, then we have regional register, we represent Asia Pacific, which is known as MOPCAP. Then national level, uh, every country has to have its national register. Because in international register or regional register, there is a limitation. In two-year cycle, you can maximum nominate two nominations from one country. Although joint nomination, there is no limitation. You can have as many as joint nominations. But in national register, you can have as much as you want. You can, you can nominate 1,000 document in one year. Because that's your own national register. You, it is, you, you have to lay down policy. As uh, Professor Gala rightly pointed out that the state party has certain kind of flexibility in operating within, within their country. So national register, it is our, our own decision how much, how big we want, but that need to be created. 
So this international register currently having about 494 uh, inscription, and in this register so far we have 11 inscription, uh, which were nominated uh, from uh, different uh, uh, parts. And uh, I, as an individual library expert, uh, represent uh, this IAC. I represent Asia region in this committee uh, as a member of the International Advisory Committee. These are the nominations, 11 nominations, what so far we have done. We have Gilgit Manuscript, Rigved, we have Sandhyanta Charitra, we have Tarakhendra, then we have the IS. In this, not just manuscript, you can completely nominate a library. You can com completely nominate a particular collection, like we have my nominated Avinav Gupta manuscript collection. Means not just one manuscript, but entire collection of Avinav Gupta. Similarly, you can uh, com no completely nominate one archives, like this under joint nomination, this archives, the Dutch East India Company, we were one of the joint nominators for that. Similarly, uh, we have uh, another joint nomination this year, this uh, first summit meeting of the non-aligned movement archives, like first movement was held in 1962. So we were the party to that, so we have nominated files, so some of the files of that uh, non-aligned movement first summit are available in our na uh, National Archive of India. So we become joint nominated to that. Similarly, now we are working on Bhagavad Gita. So we are not nominating any particular manuscript on Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita as a collection, an uh, entire collection. We have thousands of such manuscripts on Bhagavad Gita. And Natya Shastri is which is under. So these are the 11 nominations, 12 is being uh, reconsidered. And this year we are sending. When we talk about the regional register, I said we are, we comes under mob cap. And similar rules, similar guidelines, similar uh, program is at regional level. Only difference is that uh, focus, when we nominate to international register, the focus should be international significance. And when we are nominating in regional level, it should be of regional significance. But not uh, necessarily. If you have something on international significance, you can nominate to regional register also. Because it covers both. If, if, you, if you are focusing on international, then regional significance is already there. So this regional committee, uh, which is uh, uh, Asia Pacific, have 43 countries and about 63 no inscriptions are there. Somehow we have not submitted any nomination in the past, but this year these three nominations have been submitted to the regional register. Ramcharit Manas of Tulsidas and the manuscript of Shraddha Loka with, and then manuscripts of the Panchatantra, Panchatantra story you all know. So these three nominations we have already sent to the uh, UNESCO uh, mob cap, regional register. Then national level, we, we, as I mentioned, that we need to create and we need to uh, uh, set up a national committee and also national register. That is process is going on and I'm sure we have dynamic director like Mr. Anish Rajan, he will definitely help us in getting it done very soon. So proposal is uh, 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 under consideration. Uh, National Register, we, are, we have identified some manuscript, but uh, I will not speak more about that. Now, how basically uh, this program is being implemented? Uh, we have, uh, like you, you have been knowing that uh, we have UNESCO uh, headquarter and then every country we have UNESCO offices. And within the country we have Indian National Commission for Cooperation with UNESCO. So that uh, commission has five major subcommittees and one of the committee is on culture, which is the responsibility of the Ministry of Culture. So anything relation, related to culture is being referred to the Ministry of Culture. So in this particular process, uh, Ministry of Culture has designated IGNCA as the nodal center for UNESCO Memory of the World program and that's why I look after that program in IGNCA and Rakhalanidhi division. That is the uh, official structure of, uh, and uh, the responsibility of IGNCA is to uh, receive the nomination, prepare the dossier, verify the dossier, like uh, any, any nomination received uh, from any part of the world. So like if you have to consider to submit a nomination, you have to approach IGNCA. Whenever there is a cycle announcement, we make announcement in the, uh, on the website of IGNCA 
and also on social media and we also send emails to the different archive that like this current cycle is on and you can submit your nominations. So in response to that, you can prepare a nomination dossier and can submit to IGNC. And uh, IGNC's role is to promote this program, to, to make dossiers, to scrutinize the dossiers, and also to coordinate with the Ministry of Culture for implementation of this program uh, since 2004. Now, what is the process for nomination? Like I have mentioned, the first process is that this call for cycle, uh, nomination cycle, it is a two-year cycle. Uh, basically, why two years? Because uh, it takes time in verifying the documents in uh, uh, UNESCO uh, headquarter as well as in uh, regional. Uh, so the first process is that once announcement came, you have to submit uh, your nomination dossier to IGNCA. Uh, and after uh, receiving it, IGNC either uh, scrutinize it or they themselves also prepare nomination do do dossier which go to the Ministry of Culture for approval. And after the approval of the Ministry of Culture, it goes to UNESCO Commission, uh, National, uh, Indian National Commission for Cooperation with UNESCO, that forward to UNESCO headquarter if it is a uh, international register and if it is a basically a regional register nomination, so it goes to MOBCAP. Without following this procedure, no nomination can be sent to UNESCO. If you send it, UNESCO will reject it. So this is a procedure that UNESCO commission has to forward your nomination to UNESCO. Only then it will be considered. At UNESCO, there are, what is the procedure involved? There is a two level of, like there is an international advisory committee of UNESCO memory of the world program for UNESCO, which I am the member. There is a 14 members committee. That committee is having a subcommittee, which is called RSC, Resource Selection Committee. So first level of screening is technical screening is done by RSC. And when RSC give its recommendation, so RSC give three kind of recommendation. RSC say inscribe, RSC say refer and re submit, and it say reject. So these are the like uh, three kind of nomination uh, recommendations comes from RSC. And then international advisory committee meeting took place, which review each and every nomination. And uh, IAC take a final decision, it can turn down the decision of the RSC because IAC has all those powers. And after the recommendation of this IAC, these recommendations are being submitted through DG UNESCO to uh, executive board of the UNESCO. And that executive board approved the nominations and after that nominations are uh, inscribed or rejected or whatever announcements are done. In case of regional register, after uh, they also have a RSC. So regional register after RSC recommendation, then there is a general assembly of MOBCAP. Every two years there is a meeting took place. And in that meeting of the members of Asia Pacific, who are the members of Asia Pacific MOBCAP committee, they take call and they decide which nominations to be inscribed, which not to be described. Here, Assembly, that assembly is authorized to make an announcement. There is no further procedure involved in it. And after uh, uh, this uh, announcement, uh, then uh, UNESCO put it on website. And uh, uh, in case of MOBCAP, there is a ceremony held on the same day in the last day of the uh, assembly and certificates are being given. Uh, but that is, there is no such presentation in case of uh, uh, international register. It is just uh, is, uh, announcement is made on the website. And then a nomination dossier is also, with, you, you can see all the 12 nominations uh, available. What is the advantage of this? So basically the biggest purpose and motive of this is to create awareness, to create visibility of a most valuable asset or most valuable heritage. So people know that this is like Bhagavad Gita is considered one of the most valuable document of our Indian epics. So we need to preserve it. But it get more attention because once it is declared international documentary heritage, then people all over the world know about it. Because it is on the UNESCO website. So biggest advantage is that it enhance the visibility. And when we submit a nomination, we give a certain kind of commitments that we will preserve it. 
without that certification your nomination cannot be accepted so somebody has to give a preservation plan they have, you have to give a some kind of plan and also you have to digitize it you have to provide the digital copy which is being preserved uh, there is a one international center on documentary heritage which has been opened in south korea i was the founder member of that expert committee which has created the center icdh that icdh will be creating a digital repository of all these nominations being received from all over the world which will take care of all international nomination as well as uh, uh, those nominations which are in. so <clears throat> this is about igns i will skip that not uh, now who are the stakeholders see basically libraries archives museums oriental research institute and other cultural organization which possess uh, those documentary heritage they all are uh, stakeholders and they are responsible for identification and nomination of these documents uh, and they can collaborate with see uh, within country you can have multiple collaboration two institution can do like uh, give an example when we refer nominated natya shastra bori was not in position to prepare the nomination dossier i got it prepared at igns and i asked them to sign the nomination dossier because you are the custodian of that so that kind of facility igns can also provide you like in case you don't know how to prepare a nomination dossier you have a valuable document you approach us we'll help you in preparing the nomination dossier we will train you we'll also guide you how to prepare the nomination dossier and even we can prepare nomination dossier on behalf of you uh, to nominate that and that we have done in the past uh definitely research scholars are also very very important stakeholder because uh, ultimately they uh decipher it they uh, they translate it for the future generation to understand in common languages and also they help a lot in preparation of the dossiers like when you are making dossier you have to come out with sometime a dossier may be of 10 pages sometime it may be of 100 pages it depend upon the requirement so in that case lot of research is like when we are doing bhagavad gita preparation <coughs> dossier there are at least 10 appendixes one appendix is about entire all manuscripts in the india one appendix about the list of libraries which possesses bhagavad gita one appendix is about translation foreign translation because you have to give international significance and how international significances are given see give an example last time our natya shastra was refer and resubmit because our document failed to convince them the rsc that there is international significance of that although in the meeting i i proved them and they realized that they were not done their homework correctly natya shastra has whole lot of international significance but sometime they don't know they don't believe in it they want your document should speak about it so it is our responsibility that our nomination dossier should establish that international significance so like this this year in bhagavad gita i am very careful that we should give all list of such foreign translation where bhagavad gita has been translated in foreign languages so this 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 research scholar play a very important role in this uh these are the important consideration for any valuable manuscript or any document to be considered for nomination like you have to understand historical significance what the does the documentary heritage tell us about the history of the world or india form and style of significance social community and spiritual significance rarity integrity threat management plan admissible material must be finite and precisely defined see entire guidelines of the unesco memory of the world program focus on these parameters now whenever you are nominating any document you need to have clarity on these these parameters see basically for this kind of capacity building program in my opinion i request uh, ministry of culture that next time we should have a specific training program one workshop at least one day for one program because uh, when when we, we we train somebody we need to give them some kind of hands on also so you can understand like uh, how to fill a nomination dossier and that's the way uh, we organize training session on memory of the world program because see this is the document and each document has certain significance like when you are giving a title so you have certain guidelines to be follow like keep the title short maximum 10 words is desirable these guidelines are given in unesco memory of the world guidelines document 
but many times those guidelines are not very uh, very uh, self explanatory somebody has to make like when we are talking about international significance document will say establish international significance but you may not understand how to establish the international significance so this this these guidelines which which have been given in uh, uh, unesco memory of the world program i can share this document to all of you my ppt can be given to everybody and each and every uh, title of the nomination dossier has been explained in this like uh, when you give a summary summary should not be more than 200 words if you give more than that uh, it not be they will not reject on the basis of that but it is not considered good uh, when you give nomination content detail what are the important thing you should give uh, when you declare uh, you are uh, like who is the authority for this document what should be the information given in that when you give legal information legal information is very important like who is the owner of that because unesco always want a uh, very clear that there should not be any controversy some people should not claim that this is my document and you are nominating it so this legal status is very very important to uh, make it clear and uh, copyright status uh, generally in case of uh, manuscripts there is no copyright because these are already away from the copyright law of india but definitely there is a ownership rights on that and then accessibility issue how it is being accessible to the world and you have to ensure like libraries who are having this documentary heritage they have to commit that they will not deny access to anybody and it will be put under open access so that accessibility has to be clarified then also you have to identify and describe the uh, doc documentary heritage like a name a type of document catalog or registration detail where it is uh, cataloged uh, is complete visual documentation is very very important by because sometime uh, photographs explain uh, much more in detail and clarity so you can attach even dvd or pen drive or pdf file or any uh, even video you can attach with your nomination all kind of media, multimedia is accepted with the nomination so you can make a like if you are nominating a complete archive you can make a small film on archive and can attach with the nomination then history and provenance you have to clearly uh, give description of that you have to attach a bibliography of that particular uh, documentary heritage uh, whatever and referees are very important who are the important scholars who have worked on this who are the expert like when you are talking about bhagavad gita who are the best or most known expert on bhagavad gita nationally internationally in asia or other country so you have to provide list and also before providing the list you have to obtain their consent tomorrow they will not say that i am not aware of it suppose unesco get the verification from them they should certify that they are aware of this nomination and their name has been given after the due consents uh, and also uh, when you are selecting this why what is the significance of that document to the world and definitely to your country uh, and this historical significance has to be clarified on these parameters uh, keeping all those uh, issues in 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 the mind then assessment against the selection criteria form and style uh, these are the parameters given in that and also various kind of like uh, social community and spiritual significance uh, because of paucity of time i am not going to explain you each and everything but these are self explanatory or these are available in guidelines also then there is another very important uh, uh, topic in this nomination dossier is gender equality like you have to like one of our nomination from mocap came for the clarification that we have nominated ramcharit manas but we have not provided any gender equality in that and definitely it was our mistake because we forgot that ramayan sita is one of the most respected character in and our our team failed to and uh, they, they, they didn't realize that the gender equality you have to establish so then we provided them additional information about role of sita in the entire ramcharit manas and ramayana and and that was the, see if they we see luckily my advantage is that those people uh, mock care or uh, because i am working from last 10 years with them so they all know me so they they can uh, informally also ask me that yes this is something you should not uh, missed it and that was 
really I realized that this was a mistake from us. So gender equality is very, very important in that. Then also, uh, very kind of comparative criteria. Rarity has to be established. Why? You cannot nominate any document in that. You have to nominate your most valuable, rare, and unique document in this category. And we have plenty. Then statement of significance. Uh, these are all parameters for that. And you also need to provide, uh, have you consulted with the stakeholders? What kind of consultation you have done with the uh, uh, stakeholder like uh, custodian of those document heritage, communities involved in that, uh, and scholar who are working on this area, some kind of consultation is also required. And if you have not done, you have to mention that you have not done. Then how you are preserving it, how you are protecting from the threat, uh, climatic condition like conservation, preservation plan, storage, you have to provide description of each and every, like how you have stored the document in your library and ar archive. And what is your long-term preservation plan? Are you going to make it uh, accessible under digital repository? You have any plan or in hard disk or whatever like uh, possibility of this is there. And if you wish to provide any other information, there is a provision you can, you can give uh, other information also which is not categorized or classified on those documents. Uh, See, your nomination should be comprehensive, but it should be no longer than it is necessary. Although there is no limit fixed in it, but still uh, uh, whatever is needed, only that information should be provided. Uh, number of pages will not enhance the quality of the nomination. It is, it is the information available in that. Even, even 15 page nomination can be selected uh, if it is prepared precisely and uh, with uh, uh, important there is no limit fixed by the UNESCO. So these are the few things and uh, I'll be very happy to interact with you. I just want to give you some information that I have, uh, during my these responsibilities, I have come out with these publication with UNESCO. So this is the directory of archives, first of its kind in India. There are 424 archives directory with contact details, like your, you want to know more about those archives, all the details are there. And then also it has all 11 nominations of our Memory of the World program included in that. Uh, this is the, about the languages of India. That's another program which I am the co-chair. So how many languages India is having? Like, like you'll be surprised now, which is the state having the most number of languages in India? You'll be surprised to know it is from Northeast, Assam. So, uh, Assam. So, so, there are so many like uh, information in this particular book. These books are available from IGNC and uh, you can obtain copy from IGNC if you wish. So with this, I, I think I close it here. We'll be happy to answer if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Now, if there is any question, we will have a short one or two question. And then uh, one good thing about what he said is Tamil is the third oldest language in the world. And that is what they are trying to preserve it. We acknowledge. Now we will have a short question hour. There is an African proverb that said, when village old man dies, the whole village library dies. Before, so we have to have a soft corner and concern for preserving oral tradition. Now, uh, time is open for the floor. Sorry, I had so much time to speak. I'm taking up time again. But the question is to both of you, please. I mean, Professor God knows my work and so on. Uh, Institute of Asian Studies, I know about it through Professor Naburu Karashima before he passed away. You mentioned Jaffna. Uh, I was under the 1954 Hague Convention. I was in Sri Lanka uh, with UNESCO. And, and I actually talked to General Pereira who breached the Jaffna fort. He, they didn't deliberately try, turn to, uh, try to burn the archives. They breached the Jaffna fort, and the archives got, everything got burned down. But the point is that there's microfilm of the entire archives from Jaffna in the India Office Library in Blackfriars in London. 
and, and I believe it's been digitized. So the challenge is how would you deal with it? You know, sort of uh, UNESCO New Delhi initiated a project where a number of people were employed for the retrieval, rehabilitation of the Jaffna archives. It was a while ago. In fact, the same general who breached the fort of Jaffna, his brother happened to be director of culture on the other side in New Delhi UNESCO office, Preeti Pereira. So it's ironical what <laughs> the whole rehabilitation. So, I mean, that's the best we can do is that the original documents are all burned down, but there's microfilm, which probably is digitized. How do you deal with this, you know, with the challenges of memory of the world and rehabilitation of the valuable Sinhalese and Tamil archives in the Jaffna Fort? Uh, we have a similar example. Uh, you know Charare Sharif in uh, Jammu and Kashmir? Yeah. And uh, there was a terrorist attack and uh, all the documents were destroyed. But before that, we microfilmed those material uh, from RGNC. So we have those documents with us. So truly speaking now, like, uh, we have a problem of plenty because under National Mission for Manuscript, we have already catalogued 4.5 million manuscript in this country. Means 45 lakhs we have already established that we have 45 lakhs manuscript. As an estimate, we consider not less than a crore. So the challenge is this, that uh, with limited resources, uh, how to really uh, preserve it for long term. And for long term preservation, I think uh, I'm, I'm trying this to communicate again and again that we have to go for a kind of a hybrid model. I consider microfilm is the easy to preserve and long-term preservation media because one microfilm in ideal condition can survive for not less than 500 years and it is very easy to duplicate it. Similarly, digital technology has on challenge that uh, a server can crash in seconds. So what do you need? You need digital preservation program which uh, we are lacking. Like as compared to Europe and other part of the world, we are not having a single digital preservation program. So what is required? Like uh, I think we are sitting on a like a kind of uh, volcano because there are two challenges I see. One is the this media is deteriorating and uh, how long it can survive, uh, we don't know. Second is the language, that script known scholars are also being now reduced because many young generation do not have interest in Indology because they don't get the lucrative jobs and uh, not just forget all lucrative jobs, even those who have been passing out, they are not getting good reasonable jobs also. So somewhere I think a long-term policy, like you talked about policy, see, we don't have a national policy on libraries, we don't have a policy on archive. Not a single institute in this country having education on archival science. We consider a person from history is an archivist, which is a totally a wrong uh, kind of, so a lot to be done. Uh, definitely by nominating some material under this program, we can give some, but we have millions of records. So we need a, a comprehensive national policy and a kind of like uh, under National Mission for Manuscript, we have identified catalog, help in conservation, preservation. But more than that, what is required? Like take example of this 4.5 million manuscripts. Many of them are duplicate. All of them may not need to be preserved for long-term preservation. So we have to classify what we need for long-term, medium-term, and short-term. Because everything cannot be preserved for long-term. So, see, the way National Mission for Manuscript was started, it is done half work only. It has just given us information, identification, where such manuscript lies. But we need a long-term plan that how many of these need to be preserved for long-term. How many we need, need to be translated? How many of need to be preserved for short term? Uh, so uh, this is something like uh, uh, I, I still feel this only half, halfway work has been done. UNESCO can't do anything in this. Uh, 
no international institution is interested in investing. Good, good old days when people were investing, like Library of Congress was giving funds for microfilming of rare material in India. Now everybody believe India is a superpower. So like even in field of, and the most sufferer are Indian Indological Research. Indian Asian Institute all over the world are being reduced or shut down because now people believe that India is self-sufficient in doing research on its own. Uh, somewhere we have crossed that tag of a, a poor country because uh, we, are, we should be proud of it. But at the same time we are losing those opportunities. Uh, that was a short question, not, uh, not for me, in fact for the uh, officers from the, uh, the state. Who all can apply, you know? What is the ap application procedure? For example, how do we select which all documents to be done? So, Right now, there is no mechanism. Now, we do it as per our own internal wisdom or whatever. But, you know, how can uh, state departments approach? So, you can just tell them, you know, yeah. that who all can apply. That is first question. Sure. Second question, you know, regarding your, uh, uh, your notion on this gender equality, etc., to be maintained. That is on the subst substantial part of this, uh, the memory of the world program. Um, uh, this is only for a food for thought. When you look at such archival material uh, to be uh, to be documented um, or to be preserved, since you are one of the members of the committee, I'm, how these qualitative notions would really help? Like you know, if you have this very modern construct, I'm not against any any sort of modern construct, but you know. If you really want, you know, this document should have gender equality or the document should have a particular percentage of what, isn't it, uh, would it make it the, the process little more obscure, like in the sense that may not be all archival materials may not be having such qualities embedded in, in them. That is a second question, not very uh, uh, relevant as of now. My, the first question is much more relevant for the, yeah, yeah. the participants here. Who all can, how the states can approach, you know, what is the pro process of application, etc. And uh, because it is important because you are going to deal with them yeah. in future. Thank you. And Thank it you. was a great presentation. Thank so, you. Uh, for UNESCO Memory of the World program, there are two types of nomination. One is country nomination, another is the joint nomination. Country nomination means every country in two year cycle can nominate only two documents. Now for these two documents, the procedure is very simple, like in your library or archives, or even with any individual. If you feel that you have a document which is of, which is most valuable and which is of historical significance, which is very rare, and which, uh, which People worldwide should know about it. This is a document uh, which is of our cultural history, our, our, our civilization, and we want people, world should know about it. Then there, is a, there are guidelines and there is a nomination forms available on the UNESCO website. Basically, we also, whenever there is a cycle open, agency announce it and we put it on social media or agency website. Generally, for international register or national re uh, regional register, it is coming every two year in June to July. These are the timings. June to July is the timing when this announcement came. And after that nomination dossier, you have to download that nomination dossier. There are, I have shown you in the last slides that this is the process involved. So you have to fill up all that information in the nomination dossier. And that nomination dossier after completion you have to forward it to IGNCA that we want to nominate this particular document uh, for uh, Memory of the World program. Then IGNCA will uh, scrutinize it and if we found that it is a good document and uh, it has all the criteria or parameters required for UNESCO Memory of the World, we submit it to the Ministry of Culture for approval. Once Ministry of Culture approves it, we can forward it to uh, UNESCO National Commission, which is going to UNESCO headquarters. That is for country nomination. Then comes joint nomination. Like Ramayana is having 331 versions. Ashoka inscription in many countries. Similarly, on Buddhism, we have so many rare, most valuable documents. Like uh, Maulana Rumi, he was uh, basically a scholar 
has worked in all over the world and we have a lot of material on that. There are so many such shared common heritage, shared common documentary heritage which is available in more than one country. Like right now we, are, we, have, we have been trying to get Ashokan inscription nomination with Nepal. Uh, so in, if you feel there is any document you have and it is also available in other countries, even you can try for joint nomination. For joint nomination, first you have to seek approval of Government of India because con outside country nomination, before approval of Government of India, you cannot directly write to that particular institution or country. So you have to write that we want to have a joint nomination with Nepal or Sri Lanka, like we want to have a, there is a Ramayan copy in Sri Lanka or India, you want to nominate it, we have to seek approval from Government of India. After Government of India approved that, you can uh, then, they, you don't require to do anything, UNESCO Commission, National Indian Co National Commission for UNESCO, will write to the National UNESCO Commission of that country, uh, whatever name it is there, to seek the consent of that country to go for joint nomination. So these are the two way like uh, nominations. In this regard, if you feel that uh, you don't know how to prepare a nomination dozier, IGNC can help you in training your scholar and you, or also we can help in preparing document uh, dozier and we can ask you to sign it and uh, uh, rest of the work, we can also do it. But ultimately there are only two country nominations. So in this government decision is very significant that uh, because we have so many most valuable resources still we have not nominated many of our epics so many times like we have to see that what are our priorities uh, country specific uh, that is for national or regional register but for uh, sorry regional or international register but once we start national register then any number of documents can be nominated which uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll start sometime in a year or so, so for that. Now coming back to your question, like it is not necessary to have gender information in every document. Only gender information is required when there is a, some significance in that particular nomination. Otherwise you can leave many, many parameters. You do not to answer every parameter. You can just skip also and you can say that this information is not applicable in this case. Uh, that, that's uh, like, and when we analyze in IAC, what is being seen? First of all, IAC respect decision of a country that you consider this as a most valuable. But that most valuable document has to go on certain parameters. Like uh, Korea nominated a document on peasant movements. This is a very recent phenomena. It is not like uh, a very rare or historical document in our context, like if we analyze, but uh, Southeast uh, Korea is a very, not a very like old history or uh, old record. If they have to nominate, they cannot have such a manuscript collection what we have. So uh, then IAC has to see that what is the impact of that peasant movement on regional or international. That so then they have to establish that this pigeon movement also affected certain other countries or other, and it has some kind of uh, issues which deals with the international uh, uh, farming community or something. So ultimately, first in first go it was uh, refer and resubmit, uh, but in uh, second go it was rejected because we didn't find that that document is having. Although South Korea believes it is my most valuable document, but IAC found no, it is not having that kind of international significance. It may be most valuable for your country, then you nominate it in your national register. Uh, it is not significant for international community, so we will not nominate you. No. Because you can consider more than 60% nomination was rejected in last cycle. Uh, so uh, IAC has its own uh, way of dealing with it. Thank you. Anyone, even an individual, not necessary an institution. And you don't require to follow any other channel. Like if you are nominating anything from Nagaland, you don't require to inform your government or your, your like, it is nothing to do with the state government. It is only Ministry of Culture has to take a final call. Other than that, no state government, no state departments, 
Nobody has to have any role in that nomination. Both, both have to, because custodian and the uh, owner, okay. both have to sign the form, because only those, the person or institution who is having that material has a right to nominate. Okay. But they can take help from, like, you are not fully uh, trained in the nomination dossier. You have the document, you want okay. to nominate, okay. agency is preparing the nomination dossier. So that can be a joint nomination between IGNC and you. Okay. But your, without your signature, nomination cannot be accepted. Okay. Sir, yes. for a case as such, uh, uh, the National um, uh, Manuscript Missions has uh, documented many manuscripts from Assam, at least thousands of them. So, the, uh, so who will be uh, able to... Uh, National index? Mission Manuscript has only digital copies. Okay. Originally lies with that okay. concerned library. Okay. So without the nomination consent of that library, NMM cannot nominate the document. Okay. Okay. NMM Thank has you. no right. Legal, legally, that library is the owner. Thank you. We are uh, sir, running sir, last time question. Time schedule. I think if you have your question, we, you meet him personally. I think That's we are running behind the time schedule. Okay. So once yes. again, we congratulate our both speaker for uh, brainstorming and motivational, uh, traditional knowledge that has been presented to us. We will wind up our session. Let's all give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much for your time. Now we would like to go, um, like, go ahead with the felicitation. So can I re request, can I request Mr. Uh, Mr. Ellen Sharma Preservation Officer, Sikkim State Archives, to kindly felicitate Professor Ramesh Gaur. Please come up on stage. Yes, can we please give a round of applause? Thank you. And, and, okay. Oh, yes, yes. And now, please, yeah, kindly, uh, Mr. Anish. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, I wasn't on